How are we now? Uh, a little better. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever filmed in that room before? All day long. All right. Ed Boleyn, Josh Pashhouse, Bill Cho. Thanks for stopping. I, I, in case people don't know who uh, y'all are, I'd imagine uh, some are more familiar than others. I'm not sure who would be who, who would be more familiar than others because we're we had a pretty uh, specific audience for this podcast. But uh, Ed, your uh, founder and CEO of VinWiki, which is both the app and the YouTube channel, prominent prominent figure in the Cannonball Run community as well. Former former record holder. Yes, sir. Hard. It yeah. seemed to drop almost daily during the pandemic, so I don't know where the hell it is right now. But. <laughs> exactly. We, it's a little oversaturated at the time, but uh, we're doing all yeah. right. Josh, owner of Nothing Leaves Stock in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania, multi-time one-lapper. This will be my ninth time. So, uh, masochist or endurance god, <laughs> you figure it out. Uh, and Bill Cho with Audi Club probably needs no introduction, but uh, Bill, the, the reason I, I had the three... But but so uh, so so I guess the 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 main reason y'all all what brings the three of you together in particular is you're about to head out uh, to do one lap of America together, which is a little suspect in a lot of ways. But one of which is you're going in a really like I think very cool but nerdy car. Uh, I, I own one too, not not as cool as this one, uh, but a, an Audi four thousand, which is not exactly the latest tech. Um, but but Josh, I trust you can keep it all together. Yes, um, I'll try not to let you guys down. <laughs> it is definitely yeah. not the normal one lap car that I'm used to. It is by far the slowest one lap car that I've ever had. And it's in the top three slowest cars I've ever owned. That's And, and then that's before you turn the air conditioning on. So Oh, I did that today. Does, does it just, work? Does the AC work? Yeah. Aren't are you former owner? Of this car, uh, yeah, it did not work in my time with the car. Um, it worked as of four o'clock, three o'clock today. Hey, there we and go. It killed about thirty horsepower. Yeah, it's, <laughs> don't need it's, it. It's pretty tragic how much that sucks up. It's, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, so this this isn't just any four thousand though, and I think that's Ed where you came in. This came from you first, correct? You sold it to Josh recently. That's correct. I heard about the cars uh, probably around 2015. I was doing an event called the 2904, which is a low budget cannonball where for less than a dollar a mile, you have to race across the country. And John Ficara from uh, Canapa and now Ficara Classic organizes it. And we'd always talked about like the dream car was one of these 12 1985 Audi 4000 S Quattros that were done by Brumos that Brock Yates signed. And so they're numbered out of 12. And the only evidence we had that any of them existed was a forum discussion from 01 or 02, where two people mentioned having them. And one guy had number one, and one guy had number 11. And of course, I joined the message board and send messages out and hear nothing. But about a year later, I got a message from one guy, and he said, well, I have number one. It's been parked sideways in my garage for 19 years. And it has a salvage title from an accident before that. And I, uh, when I parked it, it was starting to overheat a little bit. And I said, that sounds perfect. And he's like, but I don't know how much it's worth. I said, good, me neither. So uh, I can pay about $1,500 to be within the rules, kind of like Lemon's rules. You can spend money on safety stuff, but it's got to be <laughs> buying the car and stuff like that. And so I bought it for $1,500 and spent about 15 or 20 more thousand dollars on trying to make it functional. And uh, we eventually made it across the country, uh, not, uh, not without incident or issue, uh, but I, I truly love it. It's got special Recaro seats. It's got a Nardi steering wheel. It had some special Gotti wheels. Those were stolen off of all of them throughout their lives. Uh, it was also billed as having like a trip computer that none of us have ever been able to find any further evidence of. Uh, but it's uh, definitely a super duper awesome car, and they're all hand signed by Brock Yates on the trunks, which is super cool. And, and by, by the way, I found and bought the original Gotti wheel. You did? Yep. Ah, that's, that's fantastic. Amazing. They were in uh, outside of Seattle, um, so they're at my friend's house out there now. Um, they're all apart, 
but they are the original four by 108 Gotti wheels. And so they'll be shipped here whenever you get the chance to box them up. That's amazing. So the guy that owned number 11 actually went to college with my mother at Georgia Tech. And he, he messaged me later and told me a little about his. He wasn't interested in selling it, but unfortunately he passed away about 18 months ago. And his widow called, uh, called me and said, hey, I, I know you were interested in this car. If you'd still like it, we would now like to move it along. And so I was like, look, one of us will buy it. I hope it doesn't need to be me, but I'll make sure that it's sold in the next day or two. And so John Ficara ended up buying that and he just drove it across in his event called the Musket Ball. And uh, it, cosmetically, it's considerably nicer, but it hadn't been driven much either. He had kept ridiculously good records, um, but his... Uh, he, his, the wheels on his had broken. He hit some potholes, and so he had a lot of notes and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, they're super cool. They are not fast at all. Uh, no. It'll do 112 miles an hour, but not for very long. It'll overheat. <laughs> yeah, on the way home from picking it up at your place, there was a long stretch. At, I don't remember, like South Carolina or something. And it was a good two-mile stretch. No cars, no nothing. I'm going like 60. I'm like, I turned to Dan that came with me. And I'm like, all right, we're going to see how fast we can get it. I ran out of room, and I still didn't break 100. <laughs> it just wouldn't go. It was just like, I was right around 100, and it just I, I, then traffic came up, and I, I couldn't break 100. So I guess I have to be out, like, in the desert somewhere for, like, five miles straight to get it there. It's yes. Definitely not a quick car. No. But it'll be fun. Exactly. <laughs> So, so real quick, built by Brumos. I think that you mentioned that. That's uh, that's kind of a big deal. Maybe less so in the Audi world. Did they have an Audi dealership back then, or they did? You know, they were Audi, the Jacksonville and Atlanta. So there were six okay. through Jacksonville and six through Atlanta. Mine was through Jacksonville. For cars, is through, through Atlanta. Okay. And, and do any of these? Do we know if any of these cars exist anymore beyond these two? We have found no evidence of it. And certainly I've publicized them more than anybody else has historically. Right. And I assume they would have come out of whatever the woodwork looks like for them, but I have not heard of any of the other 10 existing still. And you can imagine, you know, it was a, a, a trim package that only a handful of us, mostly us right here would care all that much about. And so it's, uh, that's it. So is that signature going to become the next tattoo to start one lap, Josh? No. No, it's not. Um, I actually, I took the cannonball tuntosh, made it into a line drawing, took the 55 mile an hour sign with the red X and put that like in the background behind it. Did you get really? the tattoo yet? No, it's going to be Friday when I get to South Hill. It's a new tradition. Every time I go to South Hill to start one lap, I get a tattoo. So last year I had John Harrison, um, sign it on, you know, over messenger and then, you know, send it to me and I had the signature. And then when I showed up to South Bend, I went to the hotel, got Brock, he signed it and I went right to the tattoo place and got both their signatures done. So that was last year's. This year is going to be the Cannonball Countach. I missed the year before. I got the one lap logo and then my second year, I had a Volkswagen R32 turbo overbuilt, and we blew the turbo to pieces on the second day. Um, so then we towed it back to South Bend, grabbed the, our streetcar rabbit, and finished the rest with that. But um, so I have a like old school drawing of a turbo with the side blown out pieces and flames out of it. So I have, I have three one lap tattoos right now. So this will be my fourth one. You yeah. keep doing enough of these and you could be like wearing a race suit without wearing a race suit, if you know what I'm saying. I, I'm close to it now. <laughs> 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 yes. So um, that is, that's set up for Friday and two other people are going to get one as well. So there'll be three of us going to get So I was about to say, is this a requirement? Because I don't think my mom would approve of it. So I have one more spot open because I did get four spots for Friday. Hey, go, Bill. 
<laughs> yes, but you know, I hopefully my mom's not going to be watching the podcast or uh, you know my my eighty three year old mother. Um, yes, yeah, I still I still live in her shadow even though she's four nine. <laughs> yeah, my mom will be watching this and she's just going to shake her head but smile at the same time. <laughs> oh. All right, so I'm going to show a couple of photos of this car because Bill's just kind enough to send them over. You get a new plate for that? Oh, yeah. There it is. Cool. <clears throat> and uh, but this was the original ad, I guess, that ran somewhere. Yeah, I, don't, I, I mean, I've seen that online, but I don't know where it's from. Yeah, I don't know. I would assume car and driver, but who the heck knows? Oh, those are the yeah. original wheels on it. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Five spokes with four bolts. <laughs> yeah, it, it drives me crazy that it's like that, but their original but I wonder, like four by 108, I wonder if there wouldn't be others out there that were like fitted the Mustangs or like, weren't there like a four by 108? Yeah, Mustangs. Like the, the four cylinder cool. Mustangs? Yep. So, uh, you picking up the car, I'm going to guess? That's it. That's it. So, Ed, you sold this off to, I think, if if I've I, I, if I if I heard didn't you sell a bunch of your cars off to buy something else? I did. I was working on a deal to buy a Bugatti Chiron development car. They have oh, eight of them that they were going to retire. So I was going to sell a bunch of stuff to be able to buy it. And then when Mate Remek took over Bugatti, he decided that he did not want them to be seen publicly. Oh. And so That's they true. it was no longer available. But I did clear a lot of space in the garage and. Uh, uh, I sold off this car and I, have, I think I sold nine total and I was up to 15 with a bunch of car truck cars and stuff like that. So desperately needed to uh, free up some space and it accomplished that. And I just ended up buying two more Murcielagos after they all left. I mean, so it's uh, I'm happy. If you have space, we'll fill it. That'd be interesting though. Can they actually, I remember I had a conversation once with uh, some, some friends at Audi who in, in Germany, who, uh, kind of dealt with a lot of these test mule cars and uh, I think zero series is the term I tend to hear around these cars where like they're pre-production they can't really be they can't be sold I guess uh, or there are a lot of liability reasons around that so like I don't know that I they're not like Porsche where they retain their prototypes quite as much I mean you go to the Porsche museum and they have like the weirdo prototypes were these like prototype like pre-production or were they just tests like they were production tests they were considered development mules, uh, yeah. so they they were pretty complete cars. They released a photo gallery of one of them, and you know it's like it's got buttons everywhere, and it, it's a very different car than from an interior perspective than the ones that they sell. But um, I, I don't know exactly how they were going to sell it. Uh, I know that since they only you know build a handful of cars a year, they have a little bit more leeway than Audi would, yeah, for instance. But probably. Um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting time, uh, particularly as we look at them, obviously, with the electrification of Bugatti doing away with the W16 cars, but everything with everybody trying to split away from Volkswagen as the, the Chinese problem becomes a big deal for them. So uh, I think that's going to be really, really wild. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think we'll see Audi uh, away first, which will carry with it Lamborghini and under that Ducati and stuff like that. But um you know, Bugatti and Bentley that are, you know, sort of like siblings to uh, Porsche, Audi underneath Volkswagen are, uh, are going to be interesting. It's interesting to watch, right? They recently, what a year ago, moved Bentley underneath the Audi business. So uh, Bentley, Lamborghini, and even the last annual meeting they had, like it was all kind of presented as a group, right? With Ducati as well. So, so uh, I don't know how that plays out. Uh, you know, just go to say I stuff nobody gets here and yeah exactly gets here yeah but um all right so let's see here we have one other picture and they had this the, is the failed bid to buy mclaren so i uh, that... uh, did i lose you that's probably for oh, us that, that didn't work out oh. sorry sorry yeah, can you repeat for, that you cut out for a, for a second there yeah sorry um, and they had the they had the failed bid to buy mclaren which is probably for the best for everybody <laughs> yeah yeah We'll see. I'm curious how that whole F1 deal plays out. I've been reading like uh, rumor, you know, like the, the, the motorsport journalists who probably are hearing the rumors accurately. And it sounds like it might be, I don't know, stroll at this point or it changes daily. <laughs> exactly. So who knows who they end up with. Um, 
All right, so uh, I'm just going to show one last shot of the cars that sit today. Josh, maybe you can talk me through preparations. Uh, let me see here. Here we go. So you're not running on those those vintage wheels right now. You, no. Um, I wanted to get a decent set of tires, um, and the smallest I could go was 16. So um, got Sparco 16s um, and Continental uh, Extreme Contacts. Um, I usually like to go with Michelin Tire Super Sports, but they don't make them in 16. So there's no way I was running 17. Um, on that car um but i'm still pretty happy with that they're the new ones are pretty much almost side by side with the, the super sports anyways so um all the rest of our cars um have the super sport 4s is like the one on the list um we've been running them for years and they're hands down one of the best all around weather streetable track they get sticky and gummed up on track, but then you can drive on them. They don't wear super fast. Uh, they're great in rain. I mean, there's sometimes, I mean, we've gone through tornadoes in one lap. We've done New Mexico and Denver with like floods that we went through and they're fine. There's no risk in them basically, but they work really, really well on track. Um, I didn't really drive the car since I got it from Ed. It sat in the shop inside, dry, no big deal. And so I pushed it in the bay. I did a whole bunch of different stuff to it. Went to try to start it. No. Just cranks and cranks and cranks. No fuel pump. All right, tested out some stuff. Tried a fuel pump relay, didn't work. Put a new fuel pump in, fuel filter, still nothing. It was actually real funny electrical. Check spark, no spark. Swap the computer, nothing. So I was like, all right, I'm going to check spark in the coil. When I reached back, I had the key on for some reason, and I hit a wire, and all of a sudden things started clicking and making noises. The negative on the coil is also the trigger for the fuel pump, the computer, for everything. And that connection was bad. Fix that. Everything started up flawlessly, no issues. So that was frustrating. But uh so have you run it much since like how uh how are you thinking on reliability on this thing i mean i, I no you think no <laughs> <laughs> well I, to start the story out i flew down to ed to buy the car he hasn't driven in what two years i was trying to think if it was three or four that it had been in the museum <laughs> Uh, there's a museum up in Clarksville, Georgia, that has my, the CL55 we set the record in, the S55 we won the 2904 in, in that car. Um, maybe it's just three years. Yeah, and you just went up and threw a battery in it, <laughs> drove like an hour home, yep. parked it. Me and Dan fly down, say hi to you, check out the cars, different things. We didn't even open the hood. We didn't check anything. And we jumped in it when we went to lunch, and... We're pulling out of your driveway and you're in front with the Ferrari and Dan goes, do the brakes work? And I'm like, I really think I should check this right now with that car in front of me. <laughs> and we, we, we drove it straight home and there was heavy rain in Pennsylvania and the alternator belt was slipping. No big deal. Shifter broke in the shop. Other than that, it was like a flawless trip. Uh, you, are, you are bringing tools along, are you? Correct. Just, I don't know how to work on cars. Um, <laughs> but just, uh, you know, because my, my only thing is I could fill it up with gas. That's, yeah. You check the oil. So <laughs> I have a full toolkit. I have extra parts. I have all that stuff. Um, it's been running now for a week and a half. Um, I've been driving it. Uh, it's been pretty much flawless. I've driven it like normal. I feed on it. Um, it's been good. Uh, I put a new belt on it. Uh, Do the gauges work? The coolant doesn't, but tomorrow there will be a digital <laughs> gauge on the dash. Because, you know, the clusters on them just aren't reliable. So I, I got a little digital one I'll stick on the dash. So we'll have temp gauge on that. Um, the oil, oil temp works. Uh, alternator gauge works. 
speedo works, pack works, odometer does not work. Um, gas gauge seems to be there. Um, brakes are all good. Suspension's all good. Got it aligned today. Uh, forget what else I did. Check the, I mean, everything's pretty solid on it right now. Um, put a CB radio in just because of nostalgia. Um, and we had the antenna on the back. It had to. Yeah. Um, Was there one in this car at some point? I put one on for the event, but Doug Tabbitt took it for some reason. <laughs> I don't remember why. And he never gave it back. Well, there's a the, new one there. <laughs> so you've done cross country in this thing already, right? Isn't that what you said? I, I did. Um, what Ish. time did we run? Let me see if I can find it conveniently. I thought it was like 33 something. I don't know if it was that fast. No? I uh, thought it was something yeah, and that was with two of you in the car. It's yeah, let me see. Uh, that was this was a 2018 ride. I did 3840. Oh, okay. Uh co-drove with Alex Roy, whose record I beat, and Arnie Toman, the guy who beat my record. So yeah, we did 3840 with a 75 mile an hour overall average and an 80 moving average. Wow. Um it we were working it pretty hard, but it uh it overheated a lot. <laughs> And uh, we, were, we were pretty happy if we were two uh, lights shy of max on the oil temp gauge. Obviously, we didn't have a coolant temp gauge. So, um, but we made it. We made it. We went through a whole lot of uh, probably, I don't know, 10 gallons of coolant. Um, but uh, yeah, we made it. <laughs> I noticed uh, if you go about 90 or higher, the temps go up. If you stick around 80, you're pretty safe. So I think that's probably uh, Have you tested it at speed under load? Like under the load of like you guys plus equipment? No. Uh, we had three guys in luggage. Yeah, and I mean, he yeah. tested it already. Yeah. There you go. And it did so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you, no did you end up like having to do any like fundamentally extensive repairs on that run or? Well, at 38 you probably we the hood latch went so we and we had to get in all the time to add coolant so we ended up having to duct tape the hood and then slice through the duct tape then <laughs> reduct tape the hood and so we went through a lot of tape and a lot of coolant um but uh but yeah and then i drove back to scottsdale to look at uh, the lamborghini that was next to it and that picture was getting painted that color and that was a 10 month miserable process that I thought was about to finish and it was not, we were far from it. And so I ended up, I was gonna ship them both back together and it was, you know, insanely hot. Uh, when did we do that? It was still September, but it was nuts. And so no air conditioning driving through, uh, but we made it and it, it died a couple of times, but it, after it sits for a little while, it cools down and starts again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, luckily when we're on transit, normally on one lap, we're doing 80, 85. Okay. There's a couple runs that, you know, uh, one of the guys, Ricky, will be driving the GPI that's on the lift. He will take off and we'll just have to find him <laughs> later. Um, last year, I uh, we were cruising. I was in a Mark 6 GPI and came up on Big Chris in his GT2. He luckily saved me because he waved out the window and there was a cop ahead of us. So I decided to cruise with him for the rest of the night. And there was times we were going way too fast, um, but this Audi won't do that. So we'll, we'll just have to, we'll make it, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> so are there any, like, I'm curious, I don't know the mix of what comes out for one lap, but is there anybody running anything like this on one lap? I don't think anything like this. There, There is a couple guys that are um, going to be in the back of the group with us. A um, couple of them are very proud to be back there. Um, really good guys, uh, have a blast doing it, been doing it for years. Um, just not very fast cars. Like there's like a Honda Civic and uh, someone did it in a Hyundai, like Elantra or something like that. Yeah. Um, much faster. So walk, 
walk me through the one lap experience. I don't Ed, have you run it too, or is Josh, you're the only one with no, this first time? So, so what's the, the, the premise of the event, right? Is like you you start in Indiana and you're just running to different tracks, like hot and heavy to each track. Uh, basically, yeah. I mean, it's Saturday to Saturday. There's, I forget what it is this year, like 12 events. Track events, yeah. Yeah, and you basically just have to get from one track to the next. And they give you plenty of time. It's not like a race on the street, but it's long, long days. So, you know, you start in South Bend, you do a wet skid pad, and then you pack up and drive maybe 45 minutes to an hour to Grissom Air Force Base. Bill just sent the list. So you're at Grissom Aeroplex the same day. It's like the world's biggest autocross. It's okay. basically like a small racetrack. Oh, so this. Bill's going to do that. How are you okay. feeling about that, Bill? Pretty good? <laughs> uh, I got the helmet. <laughs> <laughs> then you pack up and you drive to Nashville that none. Next morning, uh, each morning you basically wake up and if you get there early, you can walk the track, which I always like to do whether I've been there or not. It's just You like to get there early or you like to walk the track? So I don't think you're going to get there early with this thing. <laughs> I'm just giving you hell, that. <laughs> Have a little um, pace, George. Have enough. a little pace. Yeah. <laughs> it's always nice to walk the track. First off, it's like a little bit of exercise while you're in a car nonstop for a week. It's just a good way to wake up, get things going. You can see it again fresh. And then the order that you finish at the autocross at Grissom is then your run groups for the rest of the week. Oh, man. You don't, don't, don't place that on me. <laughs> you know I'm going to get, get lost on the running him first then? It's like, you, you know I'm going to get lost on the course, man. No, so. it's not that bad. It's easy. And then so confusing. Is this a cone course? Yeah. Oh man, it's fine. It'll, it's you'll be fine. Trust me, I'll walk you through it. Okay. Um, so then you get there in the morning, you can walk the track, get in your run group orders, and you run it in the morning. And it's yeah. basically like our run group will probably have five or six cars. In. And you go one at a time out from pit, you have one full lap around the road as fast or slow as you want, and you have to stop at the start stop line or start finish line. And then they will flag you a standing start, and you have basically three laps and then a cool down lap. And then you come in pit, and that's it. Then we have lunch, hang out, do it again. And then you pack up everything as soon as possible, arrive in the next one. It looks like May 2, you've got Carolina and Lanier. Sorry, I mispronounced that. Barber Motorsports Park on the third, Hallett uh, Motor Racing Circuit on. Four, May 4, May 5, Heartland Motorsports Park, yeah. 6 Putnam, May 7 finish. So the only day you have two are May 2nd. I'm pretty sure May, May 2nd second. has three. I'm May, May, sure May 2 has Carolina Motorsports Park and uh, Linear. Right. There's no drag race listed there, but there always is a drag race. Oh. So I'm pretty sure somewhere in there is a drag race. But then we have to go to Barber. Um, Barber is, has any of you been to Barber? Yeah. It's like a museum. Like, not the actual right. museum, like the track is a museum. With like the works of art around the track. I, I've shot uh, races at that track and like those creepy ants, like the giant yeah. steel ants that are eating people. And Every track is awesome. the same height. <laughs> all the not cars really. parked there are all in like within like a centimeter of each other. It, it's perfect. So, great track, beautiful. So how do you choose who's running which event? And who, I, I, I assume at least two of you have track experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this, this time around, it's for the car nostalgia thing and fun. Right. So yeah. Experience. As long as the three of us can have fun, and we can split up races. Someone can do morning, someone can do afternoon. That's all we want to do, in, in my opinion, be fun. Now, if you want to be competitive, like the other guys in the, you know, the other cars, or what I usually do, whoever does morning does afternoon. We always get back. We always get back. I kind of think we'll just talk about it when we get there on Friday. And uh, especially this time, since it's just a fun thing for us, the car, everything, I just think we'll kind of play it as it goes. So, so Ed, this is your first time doing one lap 
did you decide like you what was the history with the car wanting to have a good time like like uh having lamborghinis and whatever else in your garage i can imagine to you there's also the temptation to try and go out and do it and be uh competitive at the front of the field versus the the storytelling side of this so uh just curious your thoughts on on starting it off in a 4000 you know, when I got the car, honestly, I thought it's the perfect car to try out one lap in because, you know, you don't have to worry about anything other than making it. And that makes right. it a whole lot of fun. I, uh, I've been to a few of these tracks and they are all fun. And I'm sure that the others are as, as even more. And so I'm excited about that. But when Josh bought the car and mentioned his ties to one lap, I was like, man, if you ever decide to run it, I'd love to come along. It's a bucket list thing. And so I, uh, I think it's the perfect way to, to experience it for the first time. And yeah, hopefully we'll come back next year or something and something much more competitive. But uh, I think this will be an absolute blast. Yeah, How about you, I, Bill? Uh, well, you, uh, your first time too. It is my first time. Uh, and I am so glad we are doing it at 4,000. No, I, I was excited that uh, Josh invited me to this. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and then he said Ed was coming along. I was like, okay, you know. Uh, but you're right. This is going to be it, it's going to be something that something that I've always read about uh, a, a car driver from years ago when they actually used to do uh, a, a one lap of America. And I was always fascinated with it. Uh, and it's always been like in the back of my mind. This would be yeah. a cool thing to do. So he gets his 4000. <clears throat> he calls me up and said, this, no, he didn't even ask. He just said, you're doing one lap. <laughs> yeah, pretty much he's like you're doing one lap take these two weeks off that's that's what you're doing uh and i said okay um mm -hmm. so uh you know obviously representing uh you know work for audi club and being in, with the brand and uh with volkswagen for decades at this point um it's exciting for me to uh to yeah. be driving this plus it's a historic i mean it's a historical car right one of 12. i love the idea that it's gonna it, it did basically a cannibal run with three very well known cannonball guy. Yeah, probably three of the best known right, cannonballers exactly. in the modern the modern era. Yeah. And now it's gonna do what Brock you know started. It's gonna do that event now. So it's gonna have both the cannonball and the one lap, which is both from Brock, all in one car. That's like one of the main reasons why I wanted to do it in this car and just have fun do it. I mean I've been a one lap of cannonball and whatever fan for years we could we keep talking about cannonball it's sure on it, it's probably worth asking because i know I, I, I think i recently caught you in the uh the haggerty lamborghini piece um but i know you're one of the one of the most knowledgeable people about cannonball can you give us a little bit of background here so the the idea obviously came from brock yates and steve smith while they were both working at car and driver magazine and uh, it was not necessarily in opposition to the 55 mile an hour speed limit as it sort of gets billed, but it was just a very libertarian pursuit of like the best cars they could round up and the best cars they could put together, the uh, best cars, best drivers, everything that they could do and see what was possible. And so they ran it four times competitively in 71, 72, 75, and 79. And after that, obviously the movie was in the works and uh, there was a lot of pressure from a lot of sides for Brock to stop doing it. And so that's where one lap came from. And so they ran it for the first time in 84. And um, it's, uh, you know, it originally it was very much a cannonball around the country. So they couldn't do New York to LA because they were too conspicuous. So they decided to run New York to Seattle, down to LA, and then across down to Miami and then up. And so it was 11,000 miles. And uh, an absolute mess, but uh, not so much the tracks, but they uh, they were on the road. And then what was the first year they did it on tracks, Josh? Um, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm guessing it was early 90s because um, they were still doing 10,000, 11,000 miles, just checkpoint type thing all the way up till then. Yep. So there were some continuation events like the U.S. Express and the three ball rally and things like that that went on into the 80s. And so the fastest time out of Cannonball was 32 hours, 51 minutes. The fastest time from the U.S. Express was 3207. And that stood until 2006 when Alex Roy and Dave Maher set the record uh, of 30, 3104. And then we set it in 2013 at 2850.
And so it was one of those ideas that you hear about and it just sort of possesses your subconscious until you find a way to scratch the itch. And so I consider right. myself blessed to have found a challenge like that to pursue for as long as I could. I mean, it took me 10 years from thinking that would be awesome to standing at the Portofino. And I, uh, I was, it's been a, a tremendous part of my life. I've met some amazing people you guys included through the connection there. And it's, uh, it's been a huge honor. And in 2016, we had an event uh, around the Greenwich Concord Elegance, and it was a Cannonballers reunion. And it was one of the first times that I'd had the chance to really sit down and talk to a lot of people that ran it in the 70s. And it was so apparent that their grandkids had gotten tired of hearing their stories because they were so <laughs> excited to tell them. And if it hadn't been for that, you know, this was about a year before we launched the Venwick mm -hmm. YouTube channel. I don't think it ever would have happened. I, I, I thought that like, these are stories that deserve to be immortalized totally. and uh, finding the right platform, because honestly, right there was not the platform for them to all go on, you know, hour long diatribes about how much it meant right. to their lives 30, 40 years ago. And uh, so it's been a it's been a huge honor to have so many of them come and share their stories and the more modern stories and things like that. So uh, so yeah, I never intended to be the figurehead of it, but it's been a a lot of fun. It's that I'll tell you just as a, a fan of what automotive content on YouTube, uh, I I think your formula is brilliant, right? Because you're actually getting some wonderful stories out there. It's not a it's very easy to do from the appearances. Most of the videos I've seen, they're on your set there. Uh, you know, you're not you're not at some expensive shoot or anything else, but you're getting these stories that literally, uh, you know, they probably never told, at least to an audience of any size. And and uh, it's fantastic. Right. It's cataloging automotive history and a really kind of niche part of automotive history that otherwise you wouldn't get to see or hear about. So, well, thank you. For that. I appreciate it. It's uh, it's been an awful lot of fun. And I'm glad that, you know, we found YouTube as a good way to promote the VinWiki app at uh, at the right time to sort of have that early growth that, that worked out really right. really well and so that's been the honor of it is just that you know it was the right place right time right people right friends right network and it's all just kind of radiated out from the people that i know obviously and so it's uh, there's a lot of cannonball content that uh, that i'm you know obviously partial to but it's uh it's been fun so thank you for saying that yeah, no, it's everything though, right? Like the, whether it's the General Lee stories I've seen or like the, you know, like the Dukes of Hazard car or I think the guy who saved one of those out of a, the woods, like just just great kind of random stories that I found myself immensely interested in, even if I'm, you know, more or less, I, I could, it could be something I'm, you know, very much in my lane like Audi or not at all and still uh, fascinating. I got to ask you a question though. Um, so with the different, obviously there are all these different cannonball but there's been this discussion recently of Cannonball Run in pandemic era. Like, should that be asterisk or whatever? Um, but I'm curious how that plays out, or especially some of these old timers, maybe you met at Greenwich. Um, how does that play out from like, it, of course, they had an advantage in pandemic, but even you guys running solo is very different than running with like a whole group of knuckleheads and different cars also getting attention. That could either be good or bad, right? It's either going to take the police attention or, or, or not. Any thoughts on like, do like the old school guys look at you guys who are like a little bit more targeted and strategic as like a different breed or how does that work in the world of Cannonball? I mean, it certainly is an entirely different thing. I mean, the idea that we're doing it as one-off time trials certainly flies yeah. in the face of the idea that it's a race where you've got to draw a time and there could be people driving ahead. And I mean, I just didn't live in a world where there was an opportunity sure, to do yeah. that. And so I think that there's an appreciation that we're trying to sort of pay tribute to the, you know, what we love about what they did. And I'm glad to see that it continues to mean a lot to them because it means a lot to me. And, you know, I think that when you look at it in the pandemic, when you look at it with radar detectors, when you look at it with ways, when you look at it with, you know, better the everything, case, yeah. you know, cars that have 800 horsepower. Um, right. I, I think that uh, obviously it's not a level playing field. It's not the same game. But at the same time, it is the same idea. And I think that, that everybody appreciates that. You know, we didn't know what to think of it whenever, I mean, my, my record obviously stood uh, for over six years and then it got broken a dozen times in a month because there wasn't anybody out there. And so, you know, that's fine. I was actually very, very pleased that it had been broken legitimately like right before COVID set in because right. if I'd been sitting there on my couch 
quarantining from the world as everybody's out there beating my time mercilessly. I, I would have felt a real compulsion to go out there and build a car that shouldn't exist and doesn't exist because, you know, when I did it back then, I was 28 years old. I used every dollar I had plus all the credit card limits. And right. uh, it was, you know, everything I could put together. And admittedly, I could put together a little bit more enough to scare myself at what might be possible. And so I, uh, I am very, very content to drive 100 horsepower cars across the way, or at least to the scene of the breakdown. <laughs> the scene of the breakdown. Well played. Yeah. All right. So I'll have to ask in, in car choice, uh, one lap in Canada are different animals, but I'll ask you about this. You've done it. Your record was in a Mercedes, correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, Alex is more known. Alex Roy is more known for his his BMW. Uh, I don't know what all he's running in, but I know that that's one of the ones I know of him at. And then Arne, of course, did it with the the faux uh, the faux Taurus or the the Audi S6 made to look like a Ford Taurus. What is it about these kind of? Is it just Autobahn speed and and comfort at that point? They all kind of come from the same breed of car, if you will. Yeah, it really is the battle of the super sedans and the, the E39 M5 was certainly the, the first car that really made all the sense in the world. 400 horsepower, comfortable car, 185 mile an hour top speed. The uh, compressor AMG cars that came out in 2002 as 2003 cars in the US uh, was, was really the biggest improvement over that. So I gained 25% horsepower, a little more fuel economy and, and a, a lot of comfort. Obviously the hydraulic suspension on the CL 55 that I used, uh, compensated a lot better and allowed me to carry a lot more fuel. And then Arnie beat my time in an E63 all wheel drive tuned to about 850 crank horsepower. Um, you know, spent, I don't know, quarter million dollars and, uh, then went on to, uh, that car got destroyed when he was scouting for a diesel record, uh, during the early onset of the pandemic. And so they built two more cars. They built a C6 Corvette. Um, and then they went on to build a, uh, um, or a C7 Corvette, I suppose it was. And then, then the S6. And so he didn't feel like the S6 was quite the car that E63 was. That was really it. So the AMG cars at the moment to me, make the most sense. There's a really, really nicely built S8 that's done some really, really good times, but uh, me, you can't beat the AMG cars. Yeah. What I think if it wasn't there an S8 that I, I don't know if they had it or they thought they had it for about 24 hours. And then, um, there was an, a, there was an A8, a that's a six A8 that went out the first weekend of the shutdown and beat it handily. Uh, he, I got a message when they were coming through Vegas and I, it was an unbelievable time. And so that was the first of them. And then, yeah, the S8 beat it a couple of times. And then the, the S6 beat it. And a lot of stuff happened. So it was a, it was a lot to keep track of. Yeah. Basically, German luxo, luxury cruiser, you guys are kind of just going back in time, right? That's, what, yeah. That's it. That's it. And then we go to one lap, and it's obviously a game of – Corvettes and Vipers and GTRs and uh, you know that's great that's and there's nothing at all wrong with those cars but they are not exactly comfortable enough to run 3,000 miles in. The what year I maybe you guys said it earlier I know we were talking about the early history of one lap what was the first year for it would this would this car have been around that time that they were yes. switching? 84 was the first year I believe. Um, okay so yeah. And they uh, and Doug Beecham who uh, runs the Cannonball uh, Brock Gates Memorial Fund for the Alzheimer's Association, ran it back then, um, actually with a dentist from Atlanta. And they ran it in a couple of Porsches and had a lot of fun. The uh, So yeah, it's um, super duper cool and it's great to be a part of. And yes, this car was kind of built. There was a very similar Audi that some people from Brumos had run very successfully uh, in 84 or 85. Uh, but then, you know, you also had the 911 turbos out there, absolute mayhem, uh, the same way that you see it now that, uh, there's, there's a lot of people that have the cars that can go a whole lot faster and they, uh, they're making it. The, uh, top 20 cars that'll show up this year are absolutely insane. I mean, there's a pile of Corvettes, a lot of GT3s, GT2 RS and Leclerc, and the two biggest ones are Porsche and Corvette. They come out in full force. I mean, there was guys last year that pulled in with the trailer, unloaded a GT2 RS, and they bought it like Wednesday before. And it's huh. like full out. I guess that's the kind of car you could do that with. Yeah. 
and then us knuckleheads like overbuild Volkswagen trying to like compete with them. We do fine. It's still a four cylinder Volkswagen, but we've been in the top ten, you know, in different races and uh, you know the uh it's entertaining. So we like the underdog status. Well, yeah. we got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't we're, we're way underdog with the out. <laughs> way, way, way. All right, we're the back markers. Yeah. So Do there there is a um award at the end, all remaining cars, which is basically the car that finishes with the worst result. So we can win something. So we have a goal. watch for that. We just said we need to finish. That's it. So yeah. So I just pulled some photos out of my archive. I don't know if either one of you uh, one lap experts can help me out with this. I'm curious. It, I think it's 1985 or 1986. Uh, John Buffum, Audi rally driver. I don't know if he ran one of these cars or not. Um, maybe the car, the car you're in, who knows? Um, but he's, he's, I mean, you can see Brock in the shot, uh, Buffum and his crew. They're there at the race. I don't know. I can only see it's 19 something, right? I assume it's, the photos I have are like loosely labeled 85, 86. Any idea what that's about? George, that banner, that exact yeah. banner, the 1985. That's, okay. hanging, that's hanging in my shop. Oh, no kidding? That exact banner. That's awesome. That was the start, finished rate, 1985. Where'd you get that? Um, it was at the one lap at the end of the charity auction for the all timer stuff, and I had to have it, so. So, so do you know the story? Do either of you know the story on like when Buffum would have run yeah, or what he was running in? He was in I know it's kinda... it was a it was a quattro car. I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh he dominated. Uh, it was an issue. He was obviously a well known rally driver, and you were supposed to average what Brock had averaged, and Brock like would forget to turn the clock off when he stopped to go to the bathroom and like it was it was a very <laughs> inexact thing and so uh yeah it was he he i think was frustrated that uh it had uh that the he was doing it perfectly but not winning um but it's yeah I, i'm pretty sure that was an 85 picture okay and probably like a one of the turbocharged coupes not a not a yeah normally not aspirated 4000 car exactly <laughs> yeah when all those guys were, it was a 4,000, all those guys were squeezed in, apparently. Maybe. Yeah, whole, yeah. <laughs> yeah, whole team. Oh, so there's plenty of room in this thing. Awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, uh, Josh, did you fix the seat latches? Yes and no. Great. So <laughs> they work. We can, <laughs> we can adjust it, no problem. So when you get out there, the three of us will walk around the car. There's a couple little corks to it. But I figured them all out, and I'll just have to tell you how to do it. So the seat's one. Yep. So they slide. They do latch. The passenger side window now works, but you have to flip some stuff around to make it work. But it's simple. Honk a <laughs> horn, you know, turn the signal, and then I'll roll down the window. Okay, got uh, it. Hold your face right. Um, uh, the shifter is a little goofy, but it works. Um. That might be it. Yeah. So, so, Ed, I'm going to offer you the passenger seat uh, since you are quite quite taller than I am. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll ride the hump in the back. So, <laughs> I appreciate it. we'll uh, we'll we'll make it work. I, I've yeah. spent some some hours of sleep in the back of that car. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But we ran into an issue because Alex Roy's considerably shorter than I am, and so he was going to drive us out of New York City because he lives there. And uh, he gets in and tries to put the seat up, and it won't catch. And so I had broken the cardinal rule of cannonballing uh, because I was going to spend so much extra time and I brought a hard sided suitcase, which you never ever do. Uh, however, it came in perfectly handy because we could wedge it behind the rear seat and it would hold the seat forward for him to reach the pedals. So redemption. It, it does latch. You just have to kind of like sit back in the seat and rock the front forward and it slides totally fine. Love it. You want it? This is it just the mounts? The is bushing, it just the rail mounts? Uh, the, you know, it's, it's mounted three three points. The center point is supposed to have a rubber bushing on it. There's none in the world anymore. Um, 
So I just made sure everything worked properly, does latch, does move around. If there was a bolt missing, I put that in. Um, so you just basically put it where you want it and then rock it and snap it. With those wedge mounts you're starting in your head. George. What's that? You want the, the wedge mounts that we put in my Air Quattro fit? You want to grab those out? No. And, uh, ooh. I'll look at your car tomorrow. <laughs> we might be able to fix that. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to look for a shop uh, picture, but I don't know if I have it of that of that banner. That's cool. That you were able to grab it. Yeah, it's, it's hanging up like right uh, on the big wall in the back. It's funny, like that era at Car and Driver. I think about like like they were like it seemed like Chubba or was it Chubba and somebody else? They were really against any like any new fangled technology. Right, airbags suck. ABS sucks. EP ESP sucks. Like it be, <laughs> needs to go away. So it was it was great how uh this kind of libertarian birth to to the run or to cannonball run at least and then um even though i guess that stopped they still continued uh some some choices better than others abs and esp in retrospect kind of handy how many cars are running this year josh 85 is the limit okay oh really there was i don't know the exact number but 35 or 40 on the waiting list yeah, yeah, I knew there was a waiting list for it. So it was crazy this year. Um, do you find do you run into any problems with police getting from track to track with a bunch of stickered up supercars? Um, I mean, I guess you won't have many with this car, but typically no, because most of us run 80, 90 miles an hour. Men. I lost my license in Ohio for 18 months one year um they don't like doing 98 and the 45 you but touch like, in virginia at all i'm trying to remember what this with this trip yeah, we have and you have to be super careful there no radar yeah, yeah totally virginia's no joke so we, we definitely did back off there when we have gone through there there's really? your there's your sign by the way no i'm trying to find a pool i know i have a full picture somewhere all right i'll, I'll drop off the refract tomorrow i'll take a picture of it <laughs> so so in case you didn't get that was before we started recording uh uh we have uh, you guys are trying to find a roof rack right so you can put stuff on top so you can carry more yes well so. you know because the if you don't know, know the, the spare tire that comes with a four thousand quattro it's it's literally a donut and it fits right. to the side uh in the trunk um well uh, apparently you can't run one of those in case you you need one on the track so uh josh has a full-size spare which is now taking up the majority of the trunk <laughs> so <laughs> we were just batting around ideas i have a really old two-lay roof rack for my 93 facade way back in the day uh just hanging up in the garage um and so uh but you know we were talking about fit kits and whatnot so i'm just gonna drop it off and go back a little last so. minute yeah hopefully you can we'll see what happens <laughs> um, no joke hit up hit up mike callahan over at uh at rotiform he's got he's to work with Tuli. i bet he knows if you need a line of mounts he probably knows some nerd line on, on yeah mounts. but considering it's tuesday evening and we're leaving thursday afternoon I mean, <laughs> so, yeah i'll, I'll still enough time for I'll, overnight shipping i'll make everything work i'll figure but, it out yeah exactly josh we'll, can figure we'll, it out so. you know some big straps hanging on you know we're fine everything everything's fine everything's gonna be okay <laughs> all right so here's here's that that banner so we know it's 85 that Thanks, is the Josh. same one in, in, the, in that picture right i'm yeah. fairly certain yeah looks like it i mean that's the 85 so this is the second year very cool so yeah i had to have that do they often do i'm curious speaking of the history whether it's picking up that stuff or this car um there's a an event i'm here in hershey pennsylvania so there's a, an event that here called the Elegance that they it hasn't happened in a couple of years now, but the one year they had like what the Challenger, um, they had a couple like key cars. The Lamborghini wasn't here, but it was like all Cannonball, early Cannonball cars. I'm curious, is that, is that a pretty common, like you mentioned Greenwich? Or do, do you find like some of these shows will try and assemble whatever? Yeah, there's a, there's been a, a good effort to document the cars that are still around. Bill Warner, who uh, has run the Amelia Island Concourse, still has the Porsche that he ran in 75. Jack May still has the 246 Dino that he won in 75 in. Um, uh, the Daytona that won in 71 that uh, Yates and Gurney drove is owned by uh, 
the macaws out in Seattle. I have tried many, many times to buy it and they won't sell it. Um, the, the Jaguar, Richard Rawlings and Dennis Collins have that one. It's not running remotely. That's, that's what one in 79, but one in 72, I don't remember, but the, uh, yeah. So there's a handful of them. There's not a lot. Uh, the challenger never won, but it ran a couple of times. Uh, the ambulance is missing. It was last owned by a flower shop in Charleston, but there's a very accurate <laughs> replica built by Travis Bell, the guy who found the first General Lee out in Indiana. So we tried to cannonball that thing across last year and made it uh, almost out of Pennsylvania before it broke. No, oh. meaningful way. Yes. So uh, yeah, one day there's that. But it's got like a Winston Cup motor from that era. It is. Does it? But the replica does too or did the original have that both it is the the replica is the original one broke and didn't make it either uh in 79 but yeah the replica is built uh to a t and it is similarly unreliable was the one in the movie the original one i know yes so they reused it for that oh mm -hmm. that's that's cool i gotta see that movie i haven't seen it in years and then also um john harrison's uh lotus is the other ones right now yep. and he totally restored like frame off perfect restoration that's right that's um, right i haven't seen any pictures of it in probably a year maybe uh, maybe a little bit less than that but it's been a while but last one i saw was like the body lifted off of it and the frame like perfect um, yeah it's cool well, guys, I got to hop off in a minute or two, but uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, we'll uh, thank you, Ed. It goes. Yeah, thanks much appreciated. Is is there any uh, on Instagram? You are Ed, Ed Bolian. Bolian. Yep, uh, Ben Wiki and Ed Bolian. Pretty easy to round up, but uh, and we'll have a lot of uh, fun pictures uh, next week. Yeah, yes. looking forward to seeing you I'm guys go. Yep, absolutely. Support. All right, see you all take care. Indiana. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Ed. See y'all soon. Yeah. All right, guys. So, are you ready for what to go? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I was just, um, you know, Josh showed me uh, how much storage we actually have. Um, so I'm not bringing much at all. Um, so I mean, it, it's my first one. I have no idea what's gonna. I um, mean, he's given me an idea, but I have no idea uh, what's going on or or anything. And, and, and thank you very much for telling me which which track I'm going to be on on this on this call. So <laughs> I have done all That's the tracks. Not the only before, one. Though. So I, don't I, know. I, I can I can say that, but um, I, I I tend I tend to get lost on courses sometimes. Uh, so 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 the autocross is relatively easy because it's so big. Like the small autocross, I get to do that because they're going five foot over that you're going to be turn around. Right. Like that. This is basically like it's almost a mile long. Like it's wow, okay. It's not an Air Force base. I mean, it's a whole huge runway that's like landing bombers and stuff. And it's cool because like most of the time in the background, there's warplanes and military oh. stuff flying in and. You like drive past all these bunkers and stuff. It's pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's surprising. This car has a lot more, a uh, lot less storage than I was expecting. So, yeah, it's not the best use of space that Aaron no, car. It's terrible. Yeah, uh, because the 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 back seat doesn't even go down, right? No, because the, the gas, gas tank, tank is the gas tank. That's right. Yeah. And, and get a front wheel drive, it'll it'll fold. So what, yeah, what I like to do is. We'll fill a couple of those con uh, those containers, and then have like two empty ones, and just stack them in it. And then when we get out, you can take your bag and put it in it in case it rains or whatever. Then it's not. That's why I, I use them so we can just unload it and not worry about getting wet. Other people use tarps; they blow away. Things get wet anyways. We've used these containers for probably four years now, and it's been super easy in and out and Nothing gets wet. It's sealed okay. up. Good. Well, that's good to know. For the most part, that's been pretty good. We have we have a small parts container one. We have those bigger ones for clothes and helmets and different things. So I'll just bring out a whole bunch of stuff, pack how I think it should be. 
in the car and then Friday we'll figure out once we know what you have, what what Ed has, and we'll go with it. What uh do you drink coffee in the morning and that kind of stuff? Do you drink it all day? I could. I can. I mean I just in fact I just had one before we got on. What cup holders uh, in that car? None. But, 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 but here's the other question: how many, between how many, the e brake right. and the seat bolster, how many? How many? Because both you, both you guys would know how many cigarette lighters are in the car, <laughs> so one. we can plug in shit. Just one up front. Oh, oh you mean you can plug in uh, like um, accessories? USB or, yeah. So there is a hundred amp toggle switch circuit breaker on the driver's side to flip mm -hmm. on, and there's. Two USB ports on the driver's side. There's two USB ports in the glove box and four cigarette lighters in the glove box. Oh, because uh, well, this thing ran. I would, I, I, did Ed add those in? But he was right. That's right. The only thing is, I didn't get one to the back. Yeah. Well, I, had well, I mean, you might run one to the back. I mean, I have the iPad Mini, and I downloaded ways to it. So, um, and, and Google Apple Maps, Maps and Apple Maps. So we're going to use this as the Navi. Right. Yes. Here's your 4,000? 85. 85. So it would have been produced the year of the uh, of the Buffum, your banner. Yep. But, but I, I am going to have to drop it off here soon, but I'm curious what, um with this 4,000, maybe you can answer a question for me. We were talking earlier about like, do any of the others exist? And we only know of two that exist currently. Correct. Now granted, 4,000s as we know were driven hard and put away wet and rusted that's the problem with finding a clean like a nice 4000 is just finding one that isn't rusty because right unlike the italian cars they weren't cheap russian steel but at the same time they were they were good all weather cars and they just were used they yeah. weren't a car that someone was like a fancy luxury car that they only used in the summer they were right. used all the time like while the quattros got garage there are quattros the 4000s right were driven um and they were foul weather cars so this the way to spot your like if you think you have one of these um cannonball edition brumos built what brock signed cars it's going to have unique recaro seats which i'm right. sure we'll see when bill does his updates uh, and these are like they look like aftermarket recaro. they're like a gray leather if i remember correctly when i saw your car stamped with cannonball logo on the seat correct and they would have those wheels, but of course, most of those cars are now missing those wheels. And those were which wheel again? The Gotti. Uh, I forget which Gotti, but it, it's the same Gotti's that used to come on the like the wide body 911 back in the early 80s. Right. So super okay. 80s looking. Not right. the prettiest wheel, but unique and cool. Very 80s. Um, also, what else would they have? This it possibly, I mean, if paintwork isn't done, that's the signature of Brock on the back. Right. And then there was um, also there was also badges on the ashtray that numbered each car, and on both quarter glasses on the back doors. Um, and uh, they had driving lights on them, not the ones I have. They had square ones um, on top of the bumpers. On top. Did, did yeah. you add those? Did you add those lights? No, Ed put those on because the That's square ones. Okay. But they were on top. And Nardi steering wheel. Yep. Supposedly, and no one can verify it, just like the timer that Ed was talking about, no one can verify that. Supposedly, they had a 15-gallon tank instead of a 12. And they also supposedly had 15 more horsepower, but no one knows why. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> These are all these, sounds... these, these all these stories that right. What you heard today is basically all the history that anybody knows about. Right. Um, Has anybody tried calling Brumos? Does Br I mean dealers are dealers, right? No one, so staff turns over. Yeah. No one remembers anything about them. They said, "Oh yeah, we knew about the cars, but that's about them. like that ad that you you saw the the black and white one. That's it." And then anything that you can dig up from random old posts and stuff like where Ed found it and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, I wonder, like, people in period, right? So, like, 
what I'm thinking about, I might have an email for Hurley Haywood. I don't know if he was associated. I, I mean, I know he was racing back then, but like, I don't know at what point he starts working with Brumos. And, and, um, but I think he was there. The other thing is Buffum. Like Buffum's still around. Uh, might be able to dig up his email too. We should reach out and see what they know. I mean, any, I mean, both me and John, both the owners of the two that we know are left, and Ed, right. to it, we'd love to have more info. We just don't know any. We just know six were from Atlanta, six were from Jacksonville. Mine's from Jacksonville. John's from Atlanta. Um, and they just basically called up Brock and said, we want to do a special edition. What do you think? So how um, how do you know you have number one and that one's number 11? It was, is there they're some numbered. sort of bin cat? They're numbered. Oh, on the badge. Right. You mentioned yeah. the badge. Yep. Got so it. Mine, mine's zero, zero, 001 and his is 11. And... I might be wrong because I don't know. I don't remember all the the story with it, but I, I thought they built one to like like pitch it to Brock. So there might be a thirteenth, but I don't know if I'm if you're that car or not. I I don't know if it was my car or right. if that was just a story or not. As, as far as I know, there was twelve. That's it. Um, that's the funny thing right about like Audi of this era that's what I find like trying to cover this beat of like Audi history right it's like Audi tradition in, in Germany has kept pretty great records of everything but in the U.S. it's it's you know especially back then but even today to a lot of degrees they're an importer and so like yeah. keeping that level of detail on and granted this was a dealer package if you will that, was, that's the other problem is it wasn't an Audi thing it was a right a dealer yeah like, so but it it, like a couple years ago, uh, more than a couple, man, um, maybe like six years ago, Sioka came to me and we built an NLS Mark, uh, Mark 6 GTI. And it had exhaust intake badges, different chip knob, different things on it. And they sold it marked up as an NLS edition. I have no idea right. where that car is, but that's a dealer right. only car. That Volkswagen right. had nothing to do with that. So, yeah, well, they, they didn't, but it's, well, I guess where I'm going with that is like, you know, I, either I look back at the time, you know, like the VW sport catalog, right. With like the, the BBS body kits and wheels and, and right. whatever. I think that was a deal out of like Auburn Hills. Like somebody in Michigan put that together. I forget the guy's name. Um, uh, but like the, I guess where I'm going with that is like with that or the shots, the shots of Buffum at one lap with Brock are actually out of Audi of America's archive, right? Like at, at one time I got access to, to a lot of their archive. I don't even know if they, if anybody in, in the building still has that content, but I do. And, and uh, so I was pulling it out of there and that's where I was like, you know, it was, it was as much as it was a dealer thing, I, I'd imagine Brumos would have been fairly prominent. You know, they were racing with, um, well, they weren't racing with Brumos when they did the, the, in, the, the type 44, or the group 44 racing, like the Trans Am cars, that would have been like 89, but like, um, you know, that's all with Hurley and, and that team. Right. So like, I, I don't know, it, I'd be curious, but I mean, you you the good guy to like track down some more info because you have some more yeah. in that kind of stuff than maybe even me and Ed would even have. And Ed has more than I have. Um, it would be great because I know John would love to know more about it. His is yeah. real clean. Like his is like a nice car. Well preserved, build, yeah. everything, and but like he shipped it to Connecticut in November and did the musket ball, um, and he did it like thirty four hours or something like that. I mean, he he bombed it. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't the fastest, but he was up there. So if you guys are successful with this, you guys want to make a make a run in my eighty four. We'll do we'll do cannonball. We'll set. We'll wait for the next pandemic and then bomb it and break RNA's record. Uh, Sounds rad. Are you interested in we got I got two events potentially that you you might be interested in? I'm sure people would be interested in seeing you. May the 14th, 13th, and 14th is Carlisle Import. So that's Friday and a Saturday. Saturday is the main day. Of what? Um, right? Yeah. Okay. They, that as a VW show, it's usually hit or miss, but they, they get a lot of old Audis there, usually like drivers, people who run them. So they're not all like perfect specimens, whatever. They're going to get some of those too. But, but um, 
Uh, I'll probably take, if it's not raining, I'll probably take their Quattro at least one day, maybe the 4,000. But I mean, I'm sure they would dig seeing your car. Yeah, I mean, um, I could probably do Saturday. I don't think I could do Friday. I, I mean, I'm sure people would love to see it. The other thing is, if you can't do that, the following weekend, this is the 21st and 22nd, 21st is Radwood, Philly. Yeah, I'll probably be there. I don't know. Are you guys putting up a stand or anything? Or We are. And we're also going to do, so we're going to do a full weekend. So, like, we Tali is working on a hotel in Philly. Um, we're going to try and have guests the whole weekend. We're, we got some sponsorship money from Audi and Audi Wilmington. Delaware and uh we're gonna do Saturday Radwood and then Sunday cars and coffee at Simeon where they're gonna like put some cars in the museum I don't really know how that's gonna work yet but so if you're interested in any of that we'd love to see you um I want to go to Radwood I don't know what you have for a spot or anything if you'd like to have that car there I'll bring it cool Uh, yeah I'll bring it down and have it on display for that yeah, I mean, let me know on Carlisle and uh, Radwood if, if there's a spot for the car, I'll I'll bring it. Um, if not, I'll come and show up and hang out. So I wanted to go to Radwood anyways. All right, I'm going right. to. Yeah, I got to leave. So I got to jump too. Thanks, yep. guys. Appreciate you making time tonight.